So welcome back to the Redacted Culture Cast. We do not have a book quote starting today. Instead, this is the part two of our conversation with Vlad Say of Terminal Armament. We have been discussing the idea of a decentralized network, whether it's a mesh network or forms of using technology or forms of using or the use of technology, not as a surveillance platform against us, but as a decentralized form of communication, participation, integration into our world. So one of the questions that we had asked last episode, oh, sorry, actually, before I beget, any, beget myself any ruder, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Vlad Say. I'm the owner and founder of Terminal Armament. We make communications and software-defined radio equipment, and our goal is to just prepare and equip civilians and citizens and individuals all over the world to with the technol technological tools that they need to preserve their freedom. All right. So what is an example of one of those tools that you guys produce or sell? Give me an example. Because for some of well, us, we, so, get a little, we, we get a little monkey brain. We're like, uh. <laughs> well, so to start out, a lot of the stuff that we do specifically at the moment is kind of geared around software-defined radio. And I'll give a quick definition of that for those who don't know. When we're talking about radios, if you're talking about your traditional handheld radio, that is something that would be called a basically a hardware defined radio. So the functionality and the modulation that the radio can do is basically baked into the silicone, the hardware of the radio. So maybe it can do some analog and maybe a little bit of digital modulation, depending on the radio. But generally speaking, you can't really change much about the fundamental aspects of how it how it works other than of course the data that you send over a software defined radio just like how it sounds is a radio whose function is basically defined by software and how that works if we're talking about it if we're talking about let's say a receive radio the radio will quote unquote see a large chunk of the frequency spectrum it'll then take all of that information it'll pipe it to your computer over whatever interface, USB or PCIe, you know, whatever interface you're using to connect to the software defined radio. And then you can have software running on your computer that will in a receive in, in a receive context, it can take that information and the software can demodulate it. And whether that be AM, whether that be FM or perhaps some more complicated digital modulation scheme. And in the case of a transmitting capable software defined radio, the software can actually define how the radio can transmit. So you can do everything from transmitting very basic, once again, analog AM and FM stuff to very complicated digital modulation schemes. So it's basically the trade off of you get a lot more performance, but it does require external hardware and external software to run. <clears throat> So getting integrated into we, we we've had we've had um, Mojave Repeater on the show before, and we he started talking about some software defined radio aspects too. And so for people, even myself included, this is definitely like my jumping off point into it. Um, jump, I'm definitely at I'm literally standing toes on the end of the diving board, getting ready to get into software defined radios. Um, between you, Mojave Repeater, and Gridbase, Gridbase.net between those three options like the, not options those three like your guys's influence on me that's where i'm i'm my toes are on the end of the diving board and i'm just like i'm excited to to kind of jump into it what is what is your recommendation for getting in like like i have nothing in my house now but what you'd expect a normal not even normal but just like the average american to have i've got a cell phone i've got my kit my plate carrier and stuff ready what would it take me to get software to find radio capable what would that look like the best way to really get into it is with the RTL SDR dongle. There's a variety of them. They're manufactured by the RTL SDR blog, and uh, the the guy's name who one of the guys' names who makes them who makes them is Carl. He's behind the RTL SDR and also the Kraken SDR, which we can maybe talk about that a little bit later. You can oh, find sure. yeah, you can find the RTL SDR dongle. On their store, it's just RTL, I think, RTL SDR dash blog or just, yeah, just look up RTL SDR. They have an official Amazon site. There's a few resellers. We try, I try to have them in stock on our website, but 
it's it's definitely one of those things it's that it's something that you should absolutely have on your kit so whether you buy them from us whether you buy it from amazon whether you get it from a homeless guy behind walmart it's something you should most likely have on your kit for a variety of reasons so the reason that a lot of the stuff that we do is based around the rtlcr is first of all it is basically the cheapest way you can get into software defined radio there's there's a few slightly cheaper options maybe at around the 15 to kind of 20 dollar range that are usually knockoffs but generally speaking wouldn't recommend going with those because they will either not have any external antenna connectors or just be weaker and have worse hardware the rtlsdr has definitely become the entry level standard for a reason so what the rtlsdr is is a receive only so that is a kind of important thing there the this software defined radio specifically can only receive signals but so it's a receive only software defined radio that has a frequency range from around 500 kilohertz up to about 1.7 gigahertz and then it has a maximum stable bandwidth of 2.4 megahertz what that basically means is that it can see quote unquote 2.4 megahertz of the frequency spectrum at the same time versus your traditional handheld right hardware defined radio is only able to tune in and listen to a single frequency at a time and a software defined radio like the rtlsdr can see a much wider chunk of the frequency spectrum at a time there is definitely better and more expensive software defined radios that you can get in your journey the hack rf is kind of the next step up the official one runs around 300 dollars. you can find some chinese clones for around 100 20 to 30 dollars up to 200 dollars and it has a wider frequency range a little bit wider bandwidth of 20 megahertz and it can also transmit but it's definitely a useful tool but if you're just getting started rtlsdr is a fantastic way to dip your toes in with very little money and that's uh and all that's required is you need the the dongle which has got a usb connection um it's also got the other side for a, an antenna so you need to pick up an antenna as well um, are you what are you plugging that dongle into? What are you plugging your your uh, SDR into? Basically, any computing device that can run uh, SDR software, and the the, the software aspect. will I'll, I'll talk about that just in a in a second. But if you do want to plug it into your Android phone, there's a couple of basic software defined radio applications for phones that you can get. You will need a OTG or an on the go adapter for your phone that can uh, plug the SDR into. Another quick thing there is most modern phones are, but if you have a slightly older phone, just Google your phone, just to make sure that it is USB host compatible. There's some strange, odd old phones that don't work with that, but modern phones should be good to go. But if you are really wanting to dig into it a little bit more, best way would just be to plug it into your laptop or desktop computer. There is a plethora of software out there and I'd recommend just starting off with some very basic scanning software where it'll just show you a waterfall diagram and then an FFT at the top. And the FFT is kind of like this squiggly line where you will see spikes popping up if there's a signal there. I wish I had a whiteboard and a camera here to where I could draw it out. But just some basic scanning software where you can plug your SDR in, plug the antenna in, and start scanning around a variety of frequencies and listening in. There is... For that kind of basic stuff, there's a bit, almost basically an infinite amount of software. For If you're on Linux, a good way to get started is with GQRX. There's also SDR++, which is a fantastic tool, and some of the development that's being done behind that is really awesome, specifically in terms of the Android space. But yeah, SDR++ is a great way to, to start, and there's a few other tools and options for Windows to kind of get you rolling as far as that goes. All right, so that's that's a lot. That's going to be a bit to take in, but I, I, I think I got my notes sufficiently ascribed. <laughs> I think it's like, oh, my gosh, so much information. I love it. Um, I never understood why people hated going to school. Like, you just get to learn and eat material. It's delicious. Sometimes you got to argue with it, but fine, whatever. Um, so <laughs> this I, so the, so, so. Part of it is having the capability. The other is knowing how to use it. I think we've covered a little bit on some of the basics on how to use it in a couple of other episodes uh, with the other fellows. But uh, you brought up something on one of your Instagram 
videos that had to do with sort of what I would describe as getting a, a better picture of the signal environment in your area, in your AO, your area of operations where you live. And so like basically getting, understanding what the norm is, what the standard, what the standard communication level is in your area. Could you write, could you, yeah. am I, am I still, am I communicating this yeah. clearly? So yeah. would you explain how, how you'd go about doing something like that? Like what are the things that you're looking for? What is your objective? Um, and then, so like in other words if i were to use if i wanted to i have already i've already started an area study of in my of my immediate environment i've got my maps out on my wall i got my yarn strings with my mafia leaders i've got my <laughs> uh yeah right so i've got my you know like I, I started to pay attention to what's going on in my environment my immediate area i'm turning off joe biden or whatever and i'm starting to pay attention to what's going on in my like my affected environment and I'm starting to, uh, you know, like I know where avenues of approach are. I've got my map on the wall where I'm starting to look at various risks and dangers. Um, but then I've also started looking at also things like, you know, I've got my well attunement to the weather patterns and what tends to go on and what are the, the, the some of even the logistics chains like the trains and what how does how does produce approach uh, enter into my environment. But now you wanted to add like another layer to that area of operation study that has to do with the signal intelligence or the what is the signals? How would you use? Could you you do? Could you use an RTL SDR to accomplish this? And and if so, how would you do it? Absolutely, I think that is specifically for the RTL SDR since it is receive only. I think that is basically the primary use case of it is just intelligence gathering. And of course, with with intelligence gathering come all of the all of the problems with it, and you know uh, there being just a ton of information to digest. But if you're just if you're just starting out, I think a good way to start off is use the use the SDR to just listen into some basic radio signals. There's of course going to be some stuff on the like uh, broadcasting FM channels where you know they'll they'll broadcast like weather information and stuff. But from like a, a very low level perspective, the goal with intelligence gathering with a radio is to just pull as much useful information out of, well, the information that's constantly being transmit and broadcast and bombarded through our bodies over radio waves constantly and to capture as much of as much of that information as possible. And then, of course, obviously, the second part is a little bit more tricky, but discerning what is actually useful and applicable to you. So there's there's a variety of ways to do that. Some place that you might start is, like I mentioned, listening into just to get your toes in the water, listening into just some FM radio stations that are just playing music. Then you can maybe move up a little bit in the frequency spectrum and listen to some of, like I was saying, the weather broadcasts. There's also usually a lot of activity that is going on on the amateur radio band, so VHF and UHF. And while some of it can absolutely be just, you know, <laughs> a bit of mindless ham chit chat, specifically if there's some sort of event going on, or specifically weather events, the hams do tend to like, and enjoy talking about that, you can tune into that and get kind of a general idea of what people are discussing, what information people are passing around from, you know, their areas, whether it's local, or perhaps you have a, a repeater in your area that you're listening into. Specifically on repeaters, I feel like software defined radios, they're not just a useful tool, but they are also a useful learning tool. I think specifically being able to visualize the frequency spectrum, and actually see what's going on and see, you know, where radio signals are popping up specifically for someone who's just getting into radios can be extremely helpful. And specifically, if you're talking about learning how repeaters work. You know, oh, here's this input frequency. And if I key up my radio here, I can see, ah, it pops up on this frequency and then the repeater transmits on this other frequency. So the visual, the visualization aspect of that can be fairly good in, in my experience as a learning aid. Then to move up in like your intelligence gathering operations, I guess you can say something else that can provide you with a lot of information is the local public safety uh, radio systems. Those are usually operating at around seven or 800 megahertz. And those systems will have a variety of stuff on that. It might be your local police department, local fire department, EMS, even stuff like 
city works. If you're in a snowy area, sometimes you will hear uh, parts of those systems being used for snowplow operators and, you know, just talking about, oh, we're clearing this road. Oh, there's been some rock fall or snowfall here, so on and so forth. So with those public safety systems, there is some specific software that you will need to get that can actually listen into what is called a trunked radio system. That's what those systems are actually operating on. That's how they work. And then with that, you can use a software defined radio like an RTLCR to listen in and start gathering some of that information. Now, that's definitely one of the areas where information can be not just a lot more dense, but also just you're going to you're going to have basically everything. If the let's say the police department is using unencrypted traffic, you're basically going to be able to hear everything they're saying. And not all of that is going to be pertinent to you. You're going to hear Joe Schmo got pulled over. There's you know some sort of license plate number. And it's interesting at first. But if you're trying to actually use that in you know, let's say actual intelligence gathering operations for an area study, it can, at that point, it can be maybe a little bit more difficult to actually filter through all of that information that is provided there, but still a good capability to have. And it's definitely something that's still good to mess around with, dip your toes into and just see, ah, what can I actually pick up? Now, if you want to take it a bit of a step further, a lot of specifically in more metropolis and, and larger cities, Specifically, police departments are moving over to in to encryption where all of their radio traffic will be completely encrypted. So while you won't be able to actually hear what you're saying, what they're saying, rather, you will still be able to see some small identifying things such as radio IDs and talk groups. That is basically a uh, virtual well talk group that is a sign that, you know, it might be police department one or police department too. It's kind of uh, similarly almost analogous to a chat room and a Discord server, let's say. So even if the information is encrypted, there are ways that you can actually perhaps log some of that information and take that a step further where you start associating traffic with specific radio IDs and maybe perhaps with specific time correlations of time activity. One way you could definitely take that a step further is to actually start doing what is called a wideband scan. And this is something that we've definitely talked about a little bit, but this is wideband scans are one of those tools that are useful for not, not, not necessarily live information gathering, but one of those things that's useful for perhaps something like an area study or getting a baseline reading of the normal activity in your area. So the main tool for that at the at the moment is what is a tool called RTL Power it can run on Linux and Windows. You can Google it. There's installation instructions, and basically what that does is instead of having the software defined radio listen in to a single frequency, what it does is it basically sweeps the the tuning bandwidth of that software defined radio across a very wide frequency range. So you know. Uh, you can do you can do very wide band scans. You can do scans that actually cover the um, entire frequency range of your SDR dongle. And so, while you won't be able to actually tune in and listen into individual signals, what that will give you is basically power readings over time uh, on essentially the frequency spectrum. So you can basically take that output and then you can visualize it into a heat map, and then you can look at it and say, ah. Here, you know, around like this, this chunk of the frequency spectrum, I can see there is, you know, a lot of activity. Maybe it's in the amateur radio spectrum. And you can start correlating that with time and say like, oh, okay, during, during these parts of the day, this chunk of the frequency spectrum is active. You know, during this parts of the day, this chunk of the frequency spectrum is active. You know, maybe when there's some road construction, you see a little bit more activity in some of the itinerant business bands, you know, maybe in VHF or UHF. And so tools like that can allow you to get a much, basically a broader picture of what is going on in the, in the frequency, basically in the frequency spectrum around you. That can also be used for frequency planning and frequency coordination. Let's just say if you are trying to find open frequencies that you can potentially use, we'll just put the disclaimer all legally, of course, make sure you do everything legally, blah, 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 right? But tools like that can also be helpful to you to find the the normal activity of a frequency spectrum, potential open frequencies that might be available for use, or potentially ways that you can 
blend into the frequency spectrum if you are trying to do something more along the lines of that nature. Jeez. Okay. Well, now that I am, uh, <laughs> now that I have a lot to work with, I've, I've been, I've, I, I, I thankfully have a little bit of this material because I was watching some of it beforehand. But the biggest advantage that I see going on here is that you, you know, you, you might understand the pattern of, of life uh, that what's the, of what's going on around you. Um, so what you're doing is you're establishing like the pattern of life for radio, the, the radio frequency, because as it's moving across the bandwidth. It's essentially just measuring how much of that is being used, and then it, it's keeping it's and it's keep continuously tracking that over time. So that's yeah. how I understand it, right? So that you can look at basically a, a you know a twenty four hour schedule or however long you were running it. Um, so so I could understand I could see an application of running it from your house, like running a big antenna up off your roof, to see what's going on in your immediate area. That would make sense, depending on where you live. What about making a mobile version of something like that? Is there like is there any advantage to using that quickly, or how would I translate this around? Um, quickly, be, as in be, like, what would be necessary ahead. to have like a, me, a vehicle mounted version of this, like so that I could use a vehicle? Like, okay, so I'm I'm traveling to this town. I want to see what's going on in this time right now. Boom! This is what this this is what the heat map looks like. I mean, yeah, you could you could absolutely do that. You just have to have your laptop and software and find a radio in your car, have some sort of antenna on the roof. The only thing with the heat map, the one kind of disadvantage is that how RTL power basically works. And, and at the moment, this is the best and kind of the really the only tool that exists to really do this. Um, maybe, maybe in the future, there'll be some other tools. But basically how RTL power works is it takes all those values and it outputs them to a CSV file, which is basically kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. And then if you want to view that heat map, you have to take that CSV file and basically run it through a Python script. And that will output a you know JPEG or PNG, some sort of image that you can actually look at. So there's not really a good way, at least at the moment, to view that large chunk of the frequency spectrum live. But even doing kind of short duration scans can be helpful to kind of get a rough idea, perhaps if you're going into a new AO and you have a day or a couple of hours, or perhaps just if you're driving through an area, you can absolutely have that running. And that's something that I will actually do quite frequently is if I'm going somewhere, I'll just have a software defined radio. I'll have it plugged into a computer or, you know, a tough pad or a tough book. And I'll just have RTL power running in a frequency spectrum that I'm interested in. And then I'll just save that scan. Sometimes I won't even render it to a heat map, but I'll just save that scan and have that information accessible for future use. And obviously something that you could potentially do. Um, I haven't done this currently. It is something that I want to do, but I'm sure you could easily add another column to that CSV file where you could actually geotag, location tag, basically exactly where you got the measurement at what time. And that could potentially be another, another interesting layer of the information. Oh yeah, for sure. I could think of um, you know, we're in we're in we're approaching the summer of 2023 and if 2020 was a uh only a precursor, that now we're starting to hear rumblings that 2024 could be a little bit more um off kilter. And so I I I have I like I have this theory when it comes to cultures and and cultural events is that in some ways the anticipation of an event is um functions in many ways as a, as a deterrent for it. And so, in other words, like, we saw this in The Madness of Crowds, not the book by uh, Douglas Murray, but just in, like, this the street, is that the more anticipation there was from the neighborhood that something bad was going to happen that night, the less likely that that thing would happen. And then there were, with, with massive exceptions, with very massive exceptions. And so, uh, which probably debunks a lot of the, the idea itself, but that being the, the footnote to introduce the subject, I think it would be useful for people who are traveling. I, I would even think like um, media personnel. Like if you're you're traveling, uh, you're a traveling media person, and you have you're integrated into maybe a security team, or you're the other side of it. You're the integrated security team, having some way to survey the chatter sphere around you would be extremely valuable. Um, and even more readily available for people on the ground. And so 
how would you do can you see that as a device that somebody would want would be able to set up and keep like man portable yeah ab absolutely the the thing with man portable and this kind of goes back to that one draw side of software defined radio being the the requirement of there being external hardware um so as far as man portable you would have to have whatever software defined radio you're using then obviously some sort of computing device if you were really tech savvy and you know had the, like the development manpower i'm sure you could spin up something to you know run on an android phone or whatever but you, even if you're using something like a tough pad or even a tough book that you know you basically just have two devices and a cable and you'd be basically good to go and then you just choose your antennas for the what's, frequencies spectrum that you're interested in what's the uh what's the market price what's the going rate of a tough a tough pad right now uh n plus one <laughs> after this comes out <laughs> um uh, damn there's a variety that you can get <laughs> uh there's a variety that you can get uh i believe you can even get some of them used on ebay as low as uh a couple hundred bucks you know one two three hundred dollars there's absolutely some newer ones with you know a lot newer hardware that will you know obviously go up into several hundreds of dollars and you know i'm sure there's some state-of-the-art stuff that's up in the thousands but yeah generally speaking you'll be you'll be good to go just do a little bit of research on potentially what specs you might need just get something that you know has a good quad core processor at the at the very least and you know eight gigs of ram should be good to go you can obviously you can always replace the hard drive later for more space noted quad core processor eight gigs of ram and then third thing is hard our hard drive space um yeah and so yeah. as far as the as far as the software side goes that's actually one of the things that <clears throat> we are trying to solve right now and specifically right talking about our, our product the sdr stick and software for that one of the things that we are actively trying to develop we developed basically a a smaller like preliminary version of that where essentially what the functionality is is it'll take one of the sdr tuners and it'll have that doing a wide band scan the software very rudimentary at the moment but it'll basically do a peak detection to where it'll see basically what the most powerful signal is and then with your actual like live view software to, uh sdr software it'll tune the second dongle into that frequency to where you can actually listen into what's going on the optimization that we want to make on that this is kind of there, there's a variety of optimizations that we want to make kind of down the road but the end goal would be to have a software that is first of all ideally run in the browser to where it can truly be cross-platform and then where you would have basically a wide waterfall view that would basically be a live view of your rtl power stream so you can't necessarily tune any tune into any signal with that one sdr but you are getting a broad and you know most importantly a live overview of what is going on in the frequency spectrum on a very wide scale basically and then you would have perhaps like a little slider obviously the, the user interface is something that can be developed later on but a little slider for the second sdr to where you can actually move that around and see like ah here's some interesting activity you know maybe i'm scanning 100 megahertz wide i'm scanning a bit of the uf U, uhf frequency spectrum and then you can say ah there's some interesting activity that popped up here i can move this slider over and now i have a live view of the 2.5 megahertz of that from the second sdr tuner and then you can actually tune in with that to individual frequencies and do you know whatever kind of analog or digital modulation you need to there yeah so would you mind explaining how much or, or i don't know how much of you can explain without it being jeopardizing but could you explain what the sdr stick is what how it what like what's yeah. it, what what was it designed to do what does it do and what's it ask what's its asset for the individual yeah so the sdr stick basically the design philosophy behind that it stemmed from the rtl sdr basically we were selling the rtl sdr for a while and we really enjoyed it because it is a fantastic entry level way for people to get into software defined radio from a variety of aspects now of course our business we were focused more on the tactical industry and niche and there was a few problems with the rtl sdr for that use case 
And that is basically what stemmed the development of the SDR stick. There was basically three main problems that we wanted to solve with that. The first one was simply ruggedness. The RTLSDR by itself is meant to just be a USB dongle that you plug into your laptop or computer at home, maybe in your car as you're driving along. But it's not a ruggedized design. It's not meant to be used outdoors. It's not water resistant in any way. And it uses a USB connector, which definitely isn't the most ruggedized as far as a connector could be. So that was the first issue that we wanted to solve. So we took that, we put it into a uh, ruggedized extruded aluminum enclosure. It has a water resistant connector and obviously end caps as well. So you're totally fine using it in terrain. Uh, wouldn't recommend going scuba diving with it, but you know, other, other than that, you're going to be good to go. So that was the, that was one of the first issues that we wanted to solve. And that was kind of with the rough kind of exterior beer shell and hardware design. The second one was actually physical hardware limitations. If you are going from scanning on a handheld radio to something like an RTLSDR, there definitely is a big jump because the RTLSDR can see a much wider chunk of the frequency spectrum than your radio can by tuning into a single frequency. But in the term of like in the world of software defined radios, 2.5 megahertz really isn't that much of the frequency spectrum. And that could definitely be a limiting factor in some cases. So that was also one of the other things um, that we wanted to address from a perspective. And that's that's why we basically decided, hey, instead of a single RTLSDR, why don't we just make it a USB hub and to where you can plug two RTLSDRs, two independent tuners in there. Now, while this definitely doesn't get you, you know, the full instantaneous bandwidth of something like a HackRF, which is 20 megahertz, right? If you If you are going for that instantaneous bandwidth, it would definitely be better to get an SDR to where it could view all of that at the same time and also coherently. But there are absolutely some advantages that having two independent tuners can bring you. And that was one of the things that we were trying to focus on and kind of um, kind of play, play to the strengths of that kind of setup. One of them is, of course, running two separate functions at the same time. So you could have one software running, let's say, for instance, something like an ADSB scanner, which would be receiving uh, receiving essentially ADSB telemetry from airplanes so you could view the live uh, air traffic in your area. And then you can have the second tuner basically doing something completely different. So you're not locked into um, you know a single basically software functionality. The second advantage of that is having the ability to scan completely different chunks of the frequency spectrum at the same time. This can definitely be useful, for instance, if you are running, let's say, two RTL power scans, this can actually be useful for finding things like crossband repeaters. So for instance, if there's a repeater that has an input frequency on VHF, but it transmits on UHF, even with an SDR that has, you know, 100 megahertz of instantaneous bandwidth, it's going to be very difficult to be able to find that since one of the frequencies is always going to be outside of your scanning range. But if you have two independent tuners, you can tune, you know, one of them to VHF, one of them to UHF, and you're able to see that correlation. So that was... That was the second design consideration. And the third one was software. And I kind of touched on this a little bit briefly, but since software defined radios, of course, you know, literally in the name, a big chunk of it is software. One of the limiting factors can also be the software availability for the specific task that you want to do. There's a ton of software for basic scanning, but as you start getting into more advanced uses, such as you know, even listening into trunk systems or demodulating digital stuff or doing things like wideband scans, there just becomes less and less software specifically for the Android side. At the moment, basically on Android, there is no way to demodulate digital except for uh, just recently, I think SDR++ has their Android beta out. And I, I actually believe that the developer of that is working on, he's trying to figure out some, I think they're trying to figure out some legal issues at the moment with getting the uh, codex for the digital demodulation schemes built into there. That's some really interesting radio legality crap. Um, but anyway, so the, the third aspect that we wanted to do is use some of the money for that to be able to fund software development, whether that is software that we just want to develop on our own time or donating to other open source projects that we like, for instance, like SDR++. That is something that is definitely still on the to-do list we've obviously started it a little bit with the one piece of like preliminary software that we've developed 
but it's something that we're still trying to push forward more. So yeah, those are kind of the, the three basic design ideas and kind of like the design philosophy as to why the SDR stick came about. So it's basically, here's the RTL SDR. It's good for its, you know, it's fantastic for its price. It's a cheap dongle that a lot of people have. A lot of people have used it. How can we take this and make it a better tool for people who want to use a software defined radio in a more, let's say, tactical or field scenario, right? So that was basically the problem that we were wanting to solve with that. Well, awesome. I mean, that's, <clears throat> that is really exciting because again, it comes across in this very decentralized platform. Um, it, it, in other words, when I think of it as decentralized is like, I can acquire your thing and then set up my own network and work within my own people or use that device that's even though that's not really a network device, I can use that for my own like purposes, integrate it into my team, so to speak. Um, yeah, no, it makes sense. It's it, but it's primary. It's not a send receive. It's just a receive. Right? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, good. I just I, I know that was probably a silly question, but I had to kind of jump back into it. No, no, yeah, you're so, good. So then, um, when whenever you're looking at, whenever we're looking at uh, da, 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 open source technology, okay. Um, I know I've been talking about it a whole bunch this week, but uh, when uh, I want to bring up. Um, Brave New War by John Robb again, and that is he's talking about open source access to technology and information. And this is before the era of social media. So I think uh, his socks are properly blown off at this point. But what are <clears throat> when I, when we're looking at the world of SDR, I think we're seeing a, a bit of a renaissance within the culture. And I yes, I did pronounce renaissance funny. Um, but so like, what are the other um, Let's just say other you you brought up a couple other ones. You brought up the um with a Kraken. Yes. And and a couple of other pieces that really like expand capabilities. What are what like how I know I know we like to think about some of these things in sort of like a hierarchy of needs, but I, I wanna reassess that a little bit and see what it looks like to be continuously integrated better into a fully communications capable platform where you can adapt on the fly to new SOPs and methods, but you have some solid equipment that allows you to be integrated at any given time. Um, what's the point of the Kraken? What does this thing do? So the Kraken SDR, basically what it is, is it's five phase coherent RTL SDRs. That's so it's a software defined radio that is based around the RTL SDR. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly explain what phase coherence is in a, um, Kind of like a simple term. Well, okay, sorry, going going back a little bit. The the main purpose of the Kraken SDR, it can be used for some other stuff, but the main purpose is for direction finding. So you can set it up with an array of five antennas and you can find the angle of arrival or angle of bearing of an incoming signal as long as it's obviously it's within the tuning bandwidth of the RTL SDR. Now the Kraken SDR does have some other hardware. It's not just you know, five RTL SDRs plugged into a USB hub. It is phase coherent. Basically what that means is that all of the individual software defined radio tuners are synchronized and locked together so that they are actually, um, so that you basically have accurate time correlation between when a signal is received between the individual receivers, which is something that's important for the kind of direction finding that the Kraken does. And is also something that you're not going to get just by plugging, you know, a, a bunch of RTL SDRs into a USB hub. So it does have some pretty cool hardware in there that's doing some, you know, pretty interesting RF black magic. Okay, that sounds cool. Now we're getting into now we're getting into some fun games here. Um, and so you you would deploy something like that. I, the video that you had on your Instagram it showed five. Was it four or five antennas? Five spread across. Five antennas spread across the hood of a car. Um, how does that like? How I, I was sitting there thinking, I don't understand how this functions in direction finding because how does it know where which one is which? So you uh, when you're when you are setting up the antenna array, you actually do have to lay out the antennas accurately on the. Uh, Kraken SDR GitHub account, they have all the information you need to install the software. They also have printable layouts that you can get to where you can actually align them, uh, align the antennas correctly. 
And then you also have, have to, you know, for whatever direction is forward, that would be like antenna zero. And then you plug them into the Kraken SDR, the inputs are labeled. So you'll have antenna zero, one, two, three, four, because of course everything starts from zero, not one. Um, and so as far as the actual angle of arrival and direction finding, it uses a direction finding methodology, methodology called correlative interferometry, right? Big, uh, <laughs> big mouthful of words. Basically what it does to explain it in really simple terms is it is basically determining the time difference that a signal arrives at each antenna and correlating that with uh, basically a what a, a predetermined time difference would be. So, so if you think about it, if you think about it like, think about your radio signal like waves in a pond, so to speak, right? And an antenna, you drop a rock into a puddle of water and then and you know the waves emanate from that outwards so if you're trying to do some sort of something like correlative interferometry you can basically have that array of five antennas and then you can measure you can see at you know what point in time the signal actually arrives at each of those individual antennas and correlate that and be able to kind of get a, a estimate as to the direction that the signal is coming from of course the actual math behind that is a, a lot more complicated than even I understand. I'm not going to pretend to be some, you know, d deep level RF expert, but that is the that is the basic premise of how correlative interferometry works. Yeah, no, I I, I can I can visualize it as in you, if your radio if the radio signal is dropping your rock in the pond, you've got an array, you've got four or you've got five, essentially lily pads that are placed in the water and as the wave passes over each one of those the computer can calculate the direction that the wave is approaching from by how it's passing over each of the lily pads does that make sense yeah that's, yep, that's basically that, how it that, works i know it, i i had to do you know minnesota lake geometry to try to figure that that out but that was like <laughs> oh, okay so now it makes sense to me all right cool um, and so the primary use of the Kraken is to use to do um, uh, direction finding then in, in a way that's not waving your wand around kind of piece. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be something that would be described as automatic direction finding. So you have a system that basically is set up and then it automatically tells you the angle of arrival or uh, AOA is the abbreviation that's used for that. The angle of arrival of the incoming signal. Whereas manual direction finding would be anything where an operator has to manually sweep some sort of directional antenna or an antenna with directional gain across an area and either manually or sometimes in some more advanced systems, it'll automatically uh, track like the, the input power level and then the angle that you're pointing at. But that would still be considered manual direction finding because you're having to manually sweep that antenna across. Yeah, but th so this doesn't, I mean, I, I would imagine it'd be really difficult to use just walking around. Like you could, you'd have to stop, set it up, configure it, catch the signal, we've get been, a direction, getting a bearing. We've been messing move. around with, uh, we've been messing around with making a, a man pack for that. <laughs> uh, nothing, yeah, I, uh, just. I, sh I should have expected nothing I, less. I, you've, you've just got to. I think, big, I think there's, big... I think there's a few pictures of, of that kind of floating around somewhere either on my personal page or on the on yeah Tr trash can lid just like wah, 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 wah. okay he's that but, way well so actually as far as um as far as moving around and actually locating the the source of a radio transmission so yeah to kind of step back to define some quick terms here direction finding in you know people will sometimes get a bit confused but the technical definition of direction finding is finding the direction towards an incoming signal, right? Finding the angle yeah. of arrival. Radio location not... is actually finding the source of a radio transmission in, you know, let's say three-dimensional or four-dimensional or two-dimensional space, right? Four-dimensional. <laughs> not well, not four-dimensional, at least nothing that I know of. <laughs> it's here yesterday. Yesterday. Oh. Dang. Um, Dang. But yeah, so radio location is actually any sort of methodology that pinpoints the location of a radio signal so gotcha. 
that and of course radio location is our end goal because just finding a single angle of arrival doesn't really do us a ton of good without external information so one of the ways we can try to pinpoint that and one of the things that i think the the kraken scr team has done amazingly is they have actually developed an android app that basically does that automatically they have some videos on youtube it's awesome. You set up your Raspberry Pi, plug it into the Kraken SDR, open the app, you know, you punch in your, you go to the web interface, you punch in your signal. And then basically it opens up like a Google Maps navigation. And you just say, I want to find this source of the signal. And it'll read the information coming in from the Kraken. It'll see, you know, what angle, uh, what what is the bearing that has the, you know, that highest probability or, you know, what what is the bearing that the signal is coming in at. And then it will just navigate you towards the source of the signal so you just drive around you you know turn on navigation and you just listen to the prompts turn left turn right and it'll get you to the it'll get you to the source of the signal and specifically Uh with a project like that like this thing is i think at the moment it's selling for four hundred dollars you can get it on crowd supply i don't think they're actually in stock on the crack on rf website i believe at some point in the future simply because on their website they have like 499 crossed out and the current price is like 399 but still for four or five hundred dollars the hardware and also the software that you get for free to do this it's it's honestly incredible what they've done it definitely is there are a few finicky things and it's not something that i would at all consider plug and play there's a lot of stuff that you do have to set up there's a bit of tinkering that you have to do but once you get it going and once you kind of learn the quirks and bugs for a project like that it's really impressive the capability that you can get at the price point I think it'd be really hard work software. I think it'd be really neat to put on a demonstration and then have a course where you and Marcus from uh, Cloaked Entry Co. Uh, put on a project where you're doing you're using this equipment plus his skill set to maneuver in an urban and and rural environment to you know like basically put on a training environment. I think that'd be a really neat operation to put on. We should figure out. Yeah, how to that's do that. it training stuff and classes is definitely something we've thought about a little bit. I, I definitely won't say anything like, you know, like, Oh, we're, we're going to do it at some point. It, it's definitely something that's on my mind. I would like to do at some point in the future. Oh, I'll sure. Your hopes yeah. on it, but it would be really cool. Yeah, no, I'm not, I, I'm not like, a... I, I do. I do want to put the, the disclaimer out there. Cause you know, it, it's, it's surprising how many times you'll just briefly mention something and then you'll get an email like six months later. Hey, When's this coming sure. out, bro? <laughs> yeah. When when's your course list coming out? And I was like, that was right. a like, mess. Uh, it was a, I get it. Well, thanks. Trust thank me, you for I that. Want, thank- I want this more than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shut up and take my money if the meme was a person. Um, but no, I, I think that would be a really neat co- uh, project to put on where you're you can demonstrate the app both uses in the same environment. Because I think we're getting I think we've I think we've long passed the era where it's just like oh yeah you know I'm just I you know the, the the I just do this thing over here like I think I think I think you'd have a a small but interested batch of people that would be not necessarily I'm even talking about a course but I think that'd be a, a worthwhile project for the edification of the community so we'll see we'll see we'll talk about that later we'll offline this we'll offline this conversation well those are like okay so i'm still learning about a lot of the open source information and so i really do appreciate you coming on and talking about this um i would like to give you one more uh i want to give it not give you i'd like you to, to take the floor one more time and talk about what your experiences have been in the integration of gun culture and the open source technology communities and ways that you think that they could cross you could, they could create bridges between these two groups of people that would be ben- mutually beneficial for both sets. Ambush yeah, go. So, <laughs> so I think once again, if we come at it from kind of like a, a fundamental level, what what are what is all of the people in these in these two groups kind of trying to achieve? And I guess at some level that would be individual freedom right if we can you know if we can tr- try to quantify that as as some sort of ethereal thing right and so i actually um i made a i made a short video that i posted on my personal account oh, gosh i think a few months ago briefly talking about this but the fact that you need both the digital freedom and privacy 
and the physical freedom and privacy to really succeed in this goal. And so I'll, I'll kind of try to quickly paraphrase the, the example that I made, right? People coming from the technological side, they're all about, you know, cryptocurrency and decentralization and Web3 and all that stuff. And sure, it's great. But what is $30 million in Bitcoin going to do for you if your government can just illegitimately throw you in prison with no repercussions whatsoever, right? And then coming at it from the firearm side, it's like the the ability to defend house and home is great. But what do you have to defend? You know, I uh, what what was the example that I made? It's like, you know, what do you have to defend when you can no longer pay for, you know, your your government issued house because you got fired from your government issued job and you can no longer drive your government issued car with your government issued license and your government issued money no longer works. And so, right, that's that's kind of a theme that's brought up in gun culture a little bit more, I'd say specifically recently is, right, build something that's worth defending. And I think that's really where the intersection is. The digital side can really help preserve our freedom and privacy and, you know, technology isn't going anywhere and protect stuff like our assets and identity as well, as well as give us a ton of leverage, both in things that we can do to, you know, grow informationally and financially and grow our security as well. And, you know, things like protecting our currency and protecting our assets and stuff like that. So I, th I think that's, if that kind of makes sense, that's where the overlap really lies. The physical security because that is what you need. You need to actually be able to protect yourself in the real world and the digital side of that because stuff is going more digital and you actually, you have to have something that is worth defending. And, you know, a, a gun doesn't do you any good if everything else is just, you know, completely stripped from you. And I think it's it's not wise to just focus on the one aspect of that. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you put that in there. So I will not actually, I think I'm going to have to hold on out of respect. I'm not going to plug some of the motivation for why uh, we started this whole redacted project. But you're you're right. Like, you're preaching to me, man. I love it. Because um, <laughs> you know, what's what like, it, it's e even in the sense of like intel and intelligence and privacy. Like every time you mention that, it's like it, it, it's one more reminder it doesn't really matter what guns you have in the safe if the government knows where they are and where you are and or if somebody can, an adversary can spy on you at all times mm -hmm. we're the horrors of the like and this is such an interesting argument that uh, even just kind of dawns on you from time to time if you look at all the dystopian horror novels or the dystopian novels of like the 1900s the 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 aspect that what made it dystopic and horrific was not the presence of weapons, but it was the absence of privacy. Mm -hmm. Just absolutely, just, it was not. It wasn't the presence of guns. It was the absence of privacy. Is that Fahrenheit four fifty one? They could kick down your door and burn your house down or whatever because you had a book. The fireman's job was to burn the book, or you had even movies like Equilibrium, where like there was no privacy. Like you had, you know, gun ninjas running around doing all this crazy stuff, but like the horror was there was no privacy. Or if you took um, Brave New World, there was it was a socially enforced absence of privacy through licentiousness and uh, and and soma, or or uh, you know, Brave New World, never ending observation. Not sorry, not Brave New World. That was 1984. And so I, I do think that I, you know, for us as as gun culture people, I think it's something that even me if i can be a conduit as i'm trying to learn and integrate more i will do what i can because my my I've, I've come to understand where my strength is like i i, I have I'm, i have to deal with ideas um i have other assets and, and capabilities i know how to you know shoot and run and stuff like that but this is definitely where my place is and i really like what you're doing man so let's uh let's call it let's call it for Part two with Vlad Say. Where do they find you? Where does where, where do those listening find you? How do they find out more information on open source, like like good information? Like where are the good places to go that you would recommend? And how do they find you? Hmm. Uh, yeah. As as far as good information, good source of information on open source stuff. Um. 
And my mind's my mind is drawing a, a complete blank right now. We'll pull. We'll good. Yeah. We'll <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, but yeah, if if you if you are wanting to find me, I am on Instagram and Twitter, both my personal account and the business account. You can find me there, Vlad Say. Business account is Terminal Armament. We have a YouTube channel as well. Don't post too much stuff there, but are planning on posting more stuff there in the in the future. Awesome, man. Thanks for coming on and for working through the kind of the, the the harder part of the earlier part of the conversation that took some time to really figure it out. I think this this is a good example of what happens. I think um, sometimes we we get discouraged too quickly in a conversation and they're like, oh, well, it's not going anywhere. But I, I re I'm really glad that this ended where it went or it went as far as it did. So thank you very much for coming on. Uh, for those who are still listening, this has been the Redacted Culture Cast. We are running a pre-order on the subdued version of our shirts as well as the inverted version, which will be uh, subdued is black printed on black, pops great under night vision, and the uh, inverted is black printed on white just in time for summer. Probably wear it under a suit. But that being the case, um, that that is how we keep the show running. We are a user-supported show. Uh, we are trying to grow and be a part of this gun culture that has a edif edifying influence over what we think about to be right and true and good. So this has been Vlad Say, uh, and I'm really glad to have you guys here. Thank you for being a part of this, and we'll talk to you soon.